Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. There, I got the rest of you kind of caught on. We're, we're going we're gonna to dig into a study today, and uh, it's a good one. Obedience always brings blessing. Do, don't we like blessing? Isn't blessing a good thing? I, I, I always look at it as blessing as something unexpected, something that I could not anticipate. And, and I think that anytime God does that for us, it's a perk. It's a good thing. And, and so we want to talk about how that, how that all arrives to us and, and what we're going to do with that. But um, we want to go to the book of Luke chapter 11 for our key verse, and then we're going to dig a little deeper into Luke chapter 5 uh, for our actual background. But I wanted to give you this first verse. And uh, so turn with me to Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Uh, and while you're getting there, we're just going to go ahead and pray and ask God to put our minds in the right place this morning. Father, we thank you for the word and how it brings us power and life and strength. We pray your blessing upon it as we read, as we study, as we listen and apply. Not, Father, that we become just good students, but, Father, we become good children. And that, Lord, we might be obedient and walk in your steps. Help us today, O oh Lord, that we might be cautious and careful. And Lord, that we might listen to your spirit today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke chapter 11, verse 28, it says this. He said, rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God. And that's not where we end it. It says, and keep it. To hear the word of God and to keep it means to do more than listen. The book of James says that we should be better than just hearers of the word, but doers of it. We have to engage in it. We have to connect to it. If we have a set of instructions, they're of no value to us unless we engage in them. And so what, what Luke is writing here is, rather blessed, be, uh, blessed are those who hear the word of God. It's always good to hear the word of God. It's always great to hear scripture. I love going into places, uh, restaurants or stores, and all of a sudden you happen to hear the song that might be playing is actually a Christian song. That's beautiful. It's a great thing. It warms my heart as a believer to know that there are others out there that take a stand and they want to make an impact. And so they do it maybe in a subtle way, maybe not necessarily in a huge blatant way, but it's awesome. A couple of Dairy Queens are, are, are kind of in that road and there you walk in and you, you're ordering your, you know, your banana split or or whatever it is, your uh, peanut buster parfait, and you're hearing a praise song on, the, on the, the music in the background. That makes that ice cream taste that much better. I engage in it. I know what you're all looking at. You know, I shouldn't be doing that. But there, are, I don't go there that often. But I go enough to realize that that's a great feature. That's something that they're engaging in. Blessed are those who hear, not just hearing, but that do more to it. We engage in it. We keep the word. How often do we hear things in Scripture that don't necessarily connect with us because it goes against what we want to do? Amen? Sometimes we don't want to do things God's way. We want to do things our way. And so what we want to talk about today is this blessing. Turn over to the book, uh, same book, chapter 5 of the Gospel of Luke, and we want to read an account here. And we're going to, this is a great story. I, I love the stories that Luke is has gotten into, and, and there's some great details, a part of this, but it ties directly to what we want to talk about in, in obedience, bringing blessing, and uh, because there's a lot of times that I don't want to necessarily listen to the instructions given to me. Sometimes God will move me in a way, and I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. Sometimes when there's sort of a, a preconceived idea, but let's, let's go ahead and read this story, um, and, uh, and so here we are, as the crowd was pressing on in, uh, on Jesus to hear God's word. He was standing there by Lake Genesaret. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and they were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats which belonged to Simon and asked him to put out a, uh, a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Verse 5 says, Master, Simon replied, we, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. And uh, when they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they si uh, signaled uh, to their partners in the other boats and they, uh, to come and help. They came and filled the, both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me because I am a sinful man, Lord. 
For all, uh, he and all of those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John and Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon, for now on you will be catching people. Then they brought their boats to land, left everything, and followed him. And so cons- we're going to consider three reasons today uh, that uh, obedience is so critical to the success of our Christian journey. Three whole reasons. So if you're taking notes, we've got three points we're going to talk about today. And, and we're going to find it from this story. This is a great passage of Scripture. It, it's, we probably could tell this story, right? We've heard this a number of times. Obeying God, number one, is in small ways will, uh, is essential to the step of receiving God's greatest blessing. God's greatest blessing. So our first point is obeying God in small matters is an essential step in receiving God's greatest blessing. I want you to consider our story here for a minute. Peter stood there. They had fished all night unsuccessfully. He was probably discouraged. Nobody in here has ever been discouraged, right? No. We, we don't understand what that means, do we? Man, I don't know. There's some days where I kind of look and I think, man, I can't take one more discouragement today. I, I don't want to even answer the phone to find out one more thing that's going to go wrong or one more thing that could happen. We understand. We identify with that. Peter's tired. He's, he's been out fishing. It, it wasn't that great of a success. This was his livelihood. The more fish you catch, the more you sell, and the more you make, and the more you can provide, and so on and so forth. We, we understand that process. And so he's discouraged. It's ti- he's tired. It, it's a lot of work to go out there and cast that net out. You know, fishermen today do it a little bit differently, at least on your, on your more um, you know, residential level, our own individual. We, we take a rod. We put a line on it. We put some bait on it, and we throw it out. I don't know how to fish. I managed at a Cub Scout event to break four fishing poles and finally looked at Kevin. And I said, are you done? And he said, yes, because I am. I'm finished. I can't do it. In fact, the fourth fishing pole I broke, the woman that handed it to me said, this is unbreakable. Well, I proved that wrong and I broke it. I'm not a fisherman, but I do know that the fishing process is one at a time and you pull it in. These guys had huge nets. It's a lot of work. And I'm sure they caught up a lot of junk in the nets that wasn't just fish. I'm sure they scooped up all kinds of foliage and, and junk and whatever. Maybe not like you sh- don't fish in the Hudson River, I heard. You find more stuff there than you don't want to know. You just don't want to be involved in. These guys were tired. They've been out all night. But consider or suppose for a moment that Peter, when Jesus asked of him to do anything, he could have said, absolutely not. I'm done. I'm going home. I'm finished. I can't do this. He, he could have even said, look, I'm busy right now. I, 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 I can't be invested in this. I've got to get this job done. I, I want you to hear some of the responses because we've used those excuses, haven't we? I don't want to do this right now. I, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I don't want to do this. I can't do this right now. I'm busy. I'm already doing something else. We have to connect these dots, though. This is you know, this is Peter and this is Jesus. Is he seeing that? Is he, you know, is, is this a, even anything that we connect to? The greatest blessing came from the fact that all Peter had to do was listen. He had to follow in obedience, to step and do the right thing, to listen to what God was saying through Jesus and say, listen, all I need you to do is just put this boat, set it in place, and they'll be the greatest blessing. Now, we already know the end of the story because we read through. We know that he not only caught more than he's ever caught, they had to fill two boats. They began to sink. That meant fish are falling out. It just wasn't a good, this was an amazing catch. And how many times have we missed out on things that God wanted to do because we had an excuse? What blessing, what greatest blessing have we missed that God wanted to pour out in our life simply because we had a series of reasons why we couldn't do something. More importantly, I think the greatest excuse that we have is, I'm busy. I don't have time. I can't fit it into my day. It's not the first time I'll say this. We we have 24 hours in a day. I mean, seriously, how much do you have to sleep, right? Do Do you need eight hours? Do you need 10 hours? 
that still leaves a large chunk of time to devote to your journey with God. But how many times in our day do we say, oh, I've got to go to work, I have this job to do, I have this, this to repair, I've got this to, to, to do, I've got all of this stuff. How many times do we put other things, and not to say they're not important, not to say that they're not necessary, but how many times have we substituted what God wants for us to be a great, miraculous blessing And we think, oh, I got this all figured out. If I get up today, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, this, and this. The greatest blessing comes from that. Putting God first. Putting him in the scenario. If Peter had done anything other than say yes, consider what would have happened. Would Jesus have moved on to somebody else? Would Jesus have taken and called somebody else to things. Often God's greatest blessings come as a result of our willingness. Sometimes God doesn't even have, he doesn't really have you follow through with something. He might just want want to see how close you'll get to doing. How many remember Abram and Isaac? Just get close to it. There was a mandate. I mean, I got to be honest with you. If I were if I were in Abram's shoes, I don't know that I would have been that bold. I don't know if I would have been that obedient. I, I'm just being honest with you. I, I don't, I mean, I, I think for the most part, I'm pretty sold out for Jesus. But that's a big task to say, take your only son that I promised you, that you've labored to have, and I want you to go and sacrifice. And I know that Abraham kind of looked at the idea as being, maybe there's something bigger here. I mean, after all, God did give me this son. So if he could give me one, he could give me another. Or this amazing God that I love and worship, no matter what I do to this child, God could raise this child up. I mean, I don't know what went through his mind. Scripture doesn't really give us an idea. It says that he acted on it. He was willing. And he gets to the point of bringing that knife and plunging it into his chest, and God stops him. All because he was willing. Our greatest blessing falls to the point of the individual that is just simply willing to surrender to that. I often think, you know, there's little blessings that happen every day, right? Little little teeny tiny miracles that happen all the time to us. Like yesterday, I was at this party and I thought the party was all over and then somebody brought out cheesecake. That was a blessing. And I paid for it the rest of the day. But it was great. It was a blessing. It was little teeny tiny things. And we we get excited about those things. But we talk about the greatest blessing of God. As a dad, I look at my children and I see them as an, an amazing blessing. It's a miracle. It really is. I, I, I look at how God infiltrates our everyday life. And places things in the way. Just simple provisions. And how many times have we missed those? Because we weren't willing to just lean into that. Or just be willing to say, yes, Lord, whatever it is you want to do, I'll do it. I'll just do it. Ask yourself this question. Has God been challenging you? Has God been challenging you? Has he been putting you up for a test? To something that sounds or looks a little strange, you know, something different. Something maybe even unimportant, like this will make no impact on anybody. And yet, we haven't made an effort to even remotely accomplish it. We have responded with, I don't want to, it's too difficult, I'm too busy. We miss out on the greatest blessings of God. We can sit here today and say, well, the greatest blessing, Pastor, is that when I die, I will be in the presence of the Lord. And yes, that is a great blessing. That's a promise. But while we live here in this life, we have to realize a couple of things. These aren't in my notes. These are just free things I'm going to give you today. The first and foremost thing is that we are here to represent Jesus Christ 
to present a gospel message that Jesus loves them, that he died for them, that he was buried and he rose again, and he sits at the right hand of the Father right now, working on our behalf so that others will come to him. Have you ever wondered why you're here? You're here for that purpose, that purpose alone. All the other things that we do in this life, nothing wrong with, but yet they're not our purpose. Our function as a believer in Jesus Christ is to tell others about Jesus. Plain and simple. That's the will of God. I mean, I, I've often thought maybe the will of God is just so, uh, such a mystery, so, so mysterious to me at times. The greatest thing that I could ever understand about the will of God is that I am here to represent Jesus. Wherever I am, whatever I do, however I act, whatever I say, I need to represent Jesus. So in order to do that, I've got to obey. And sometimes obeying isn't easy. You know, Paul referred to his life in many ways of always having to crucify his old self, always fighting with the natural man, always dealing with him because that, that way of life before he came to Christ well, it doesn't go away from your head. You remember everything you did before. You remember the way you lived or the way you didn't think through things or put God first in, in your decisions. Instead, we respond, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. It's too hard for me. I, I think if I were to go around the room, this is a big challenge in churches. How many of us would be willing to say, yes, I'll stand and pray in front of the whole church? I just heard a bunch of oxygen leave the room. Did you hear that? It was like a mighty rushing wind. Because we panic when we think about, I'm going to stand in front. Listen, we're just talking to God. We're just talking to God. How, how many of us are willing to step into a new position or do something here in the church or maybe do something out in the community but represent God well? And it's a little frightening because we're unsure of it. There's nothing wrong with the fear of it. It's the idea that we still need to be willing to do it instead of coming up with excuses. The second thing we want to look at today is our obedience always benefits others. Our obedience always benefits others. When we do something that is obedient to God, it affects everybody around you. Not only could the crowd see and hear Jesus better because he got in the boat and he moved out a little bit, have you ever been, I know Baptist churches, the front rows are not normally seated people. I mean, unless it's, you know, a concert. Yeah. But preaching, I don't know what, y'all afraid of me spitting maybe? Is that what it is? The front row is always, and you guys are over on that side a little far. Caleb, you're great. Right out front, not worried. The front rows in this, in this story began to fill in and people began to press in. And Jesus ran out of shoreline to stand in. He, he said, if I would just get out on the boat and, and I could sit there and I could teach and I could affect the crowd. So, you know, the, the crowd could see him. Everybody could see where he was. I don't know if this is the first account of a platform and preaching, right? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But here, Jesus is now out there. But the second byproduct of this, of Peter's obedience, was that Jesus got to sit down and teach. That only meant that he had a longer sermon than I get, right? Yeah. I, I have enough notes to probably go on for about two and a half hours, but I try to talk fast to get it all in. Jesus was able to rest and to teach and to, and to affect the people there. God often rewards others in particular, those closest to us, as a result of our own obedience. God's rewards come as a byproduct. Do you realize that when a father is obedient, his family is affected? Do you realize that when a mother is obedient, their family is affected? Do you realize that when a friend is obedient, that their friends are, are affected by that result? In the same way, every coin has two sides. When we're disobedient, we affect them too. When we don't follow in the right way, we affect those around us. We impact us. Each other, we, we, we make 
these wonderful waves of blessing to others because we just, we just followed what God wanted to do. I don't know each person here today in the journey that you're on, what God has been dealing with you about, what direction he's been trying to get you to go in. I know a thing or two about running from the Lord, didn't want to do it, had no intention of doing this. Somewhere along my early life, I, I set out on this journey, but looked at it and said, no, I don't want to do this. And God, through his infinite wisdom and power, orchestrated a series of catastrophes that led me to my knees and reminded me of who's in charge and showed me that all I had to do was be willing, just be willing. He calls us to obedience, but with his calling, it demands a response. It demands a response. Do you believe our actions have consequences? Every action that we do has a consequence. Now, realize that we tend to think consequence is a bad thing. That's because we've replaced the word punishment or discipline with the word consequence to make it sound softer. Consequence is just the result. That's all it is. It's just the result of an action. So we can have positive consequences and we can have negative ones. If we do something bad, something bad will happen. That's sort of a given. If I stick my finger in an outlet with a paper clip, I will feel some power. It will affect me. And not in a positive way. In a very negative way. Right? I, I can do things positive. I can do things obedient to God. And again, I come back to this question. I don't know where each of you are at. I don't know what it is that God is dealing with. I promise you that God is dealing with all of us at some point in our journey with a decision or a task that he's laid before us. And it may not be about full-time service, in, you know, like serving on a mission field, pastoring a church, leading a Sunday school class, whatever it is. It may not be something that grand. It might be these wonderful little baby steps because the Bible teaches us when we're faithful in these small areas, God will enlarge those at a later point. We've got to be willing to go through the smaller steps, and he's got to teach us. How many of us have been in that position where, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go do this because, after all, you know, God said he would do it. Yes, he will. There are miraculous moments where God will use you in a huge and powerful way. But i got to tell you, he's going to train us. He's going to train us. He's going to give us instruction. The amount of instruction he gives us is based on how much we're willing to listen and obey him. If we're not willing to obey him in these smaller areas, then man alive, but he's not going to give us the bigger task. He's a lot smarter than we are. Amen? And so because of that, we have to realize that this obedience or this decision to obey, it requires and demands a response. God gives us a task. He gives us an option. It's good to know God gives us a free will. Sometimes... Well, I don't know about you, but sometimes I like to learn the hard way. Isn't that fun? Isn't discipline fun? I love it. The only thing I like about discipline is I'm reminded how much God loves me enough to discipline me. Amen? But I don't love being told I did it wrong. I don't like that. How much easier is it just to follow the instructions, to do what God has said? Third thing we want to look at today is this. When we obey God, we will never be disappointed. There's not a pill on the market that can fix anything like Jesus, right? When we are obedient, we will not be disappointed. When those men got in that boat, I I can almost hear the grumbling, can you? We did this all night long. It didn't work. Who is he to tell us where to go fish? I mean, honestly, we were out there all night. I brought home more kelp than I did fish. I mean, I've been there. I saw it. Isn't it amazing how much we think we know about life? Who is God to tell me what I should do? Peter had to have thought at some point that this was a waste of time. 
I often attribute this idea or this thought to when God tells you to go talk to somebody about the Lord and you go, they're never going to listen to me anyway. (laughs) They haven't listened yet. Why would they listen today? Because when God orchestrates the meeting, it's no longer about you. It's just about your willingness to be there. It's not about you. It's, a, it's about God putting those details in place. And this is the moment, because this is the moment Jesus said, go do it. Just go do it. To go out there and, and to put those nets out, I'm, I'm certain they're tired. I'm certain they're frustrated. I'm certain they're disappointed. But that didn't last long, did it? That disappointment was over pretty quick when they started to tug on those nets and the, and the boat began to lean to one direction and they're trying to pull those nets up and they're all struggling and they're trying to figure out how in the world we're going to do this. I think in the moment, they're, they're just in a reactionary mode. They're just sort of looking at, that's a lot of fish. But I want you to see the tail end of this story. It says here that when they came back to the shore... With all of these fish, they walked away. They just left it. What? See, there's a whole lot of people out there trying to teach that the blessings of God or the prosperity of God is our only and sole desire here on earth. Whether you have a lot of money or you have no money, whether you have a a fancy new car or, or an old one, whether you live in a big house or a small house, whether you have the greatest job on the planet or whether you have the worst job on the planet. All of that's immaterial. If you're a believer and you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you realize that this is not your home. We're foreigners here. We're, we're, we're waiting for what is next. We're just here in this moment with a single function. A single function. I would tell you that this story, this application goes a long way in our life to a lot of areas, and it might have to do with things that we're dealing with personally, relationally, maybe financially or family-wise, or maybe it's about our jobs, and and that's all applicable here. But ultimately, I want you to realize that the application, first and foremost, comes to the statement that Jesus says, you've been a fisher man, you will now be fishers of men fishers of men. The problem today with the church, and I don't mean this particular body of believers, I mean this to include us and incorporate us in the greatest failure of mankind is that we possess the greatest gift on the planet and most of us are silent about it. We're cautious. We're afraid. If you understand what it means to know Jesus Christ on a personal level, if you know what it means to have the Holy Spirit working in you, then you know how amazing that is. Why would you keep that to yourself? I mean, think about the dumb things we tell people all the time. Do you hear it's going to be nice tomorrow? Did you hear the weather's going to be good? Hey, did you hear they got a new cook down at this restaurant? Hey, did you see they got a sale at JCPenney? I mean, just think about some of the nonsense things we talk about. And there's nothing wrong with that stuff. But the greatest story on earth, we are silent and clammed up and think, that's the missionary's job, that's the pastor's job, that's the deacon's job, that's the Sunday school teacher's job, that's someone else's job. I can't do this. The failure comes to this. That churches believe they have to grow only by dismissing another church, dismantling it and bringing it together. Instead of doing the job of the individual church, and that's to reach those that don't know Christ. To bring them here, to share the story, to encourage them to fellowship with other believers. That's the key to the church. To share the gospel. Are you willing to put down whatever it is that God has you doing, or whatever you have yourself doing? Are we willing to lay down the tools or the the activities, the the things that entertain us, the things that we enjoy to go and serve. To send out the word regardless of what comes back. To believe that the blessings that God, man, alive. 
I'll never forget the first time I led someone to the Lord. I will never forget it as long as I live. I've shared the story before. I, uh, I did training with Child Evangelism Fellowship and uh, was a summer missionary, and they dumped us in a park in East Orange, New Jersey. Now, no, you, you might not know anything about that place. It's a little scary. It, it's a little frightening. And I said that incorrectly. It was beyond scary. I was afraid. No, wh- I was more afraid that I was going to have to talk to somebody just in a cold way, just walk up to a stranger and say, can I tell you a story? Because there's this amazing fear of rejection. And it wasn't until later in life that I realized they're not rejecting me, they're rejecting the Lord. God put me there, God gave me the word to say, and God gave me the ability to open my mouth and let him speak, but I didn't get that. But I was in that neighborhood, and my partner, because we had to go out in twos, we had determined we were just going to sit on the swings. And we were just going to hang out. Two hours we were going to sit there and do nothing. Hey, listen, I found that now at this stage of my life to sit two hours and do nothing is a wonderful blessing. To just sit in a rocking chair and do nothing. That's a wonderful thing. It's a great blessing. It gives you time to think. We weren't thinking. We were trying to find out ways we were going to have to kind of maneuver the story. Or How are we going to do this? We're going to not run into anybody. Well, if we stayed in one place... Nobody was going to come over to us. And we figured we, if we do our own thing, people just stay away. And God had an amazing way of bringing people to us. And we finally looked at each other and said, we got to do this. We used a small tool called the wordless book. It's just colors to tell the story of the gospel. And so finally we got up the nerve and we told the story. And at the end of the story, I offered to this little guy, I said, would you like to ask Jesus to come into your heart? He went, absolutely. Like without doubt. I mean, he didn't even hesitate. And we prayed this in his prayer and he, he received Jesus that day. We took his information down, turned it into the team. And man, we went back. We were proud. We did good. But how much did we miss? Because we had plotted to be distant from him. We had planned to not be obedient. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about this little boy. It was about God. We miss out on these blessings because we're just so fixated on the things that we think are important. We're looking at the wrong thing. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're going through. Honestly, I, I, I would love to so that you're not alone and you're not burdened with this, but God is amazing, amen? He is an amazing God. He knows what you're going through. In fact, he might even be an orchestrator in some of the details. He knows what you're facing. He knows what decisions you need to make. He's not promised that, they'll, that they're easy. He's not even promising that it's going to go smooth. Because even, it, even these guys had to, to work to get, you know, the fish in. I don't know what you're battling. But I do know that the greatest blessings come to those who are obedient. Whatever it is that God is asking you to do, quit waiting. Stop looking for another reason or excuse to not do it. Just be willing. He may ask you to go through the whole thing. He may bring you right through the fire. I mean, it it could be absolute torture. But the blessing that you'll receive is so much greater. Obedience just requires us to, to respond. Be willing. He gives us the assurance that no matter what we do, He will always love us. And He will always be there for us. He's promised. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So even if we're struggling to get this, and let's say we set things in motion today and we pray, you know, during our time of of prayer, just, Lord, let me do this right. And we walk out the doors and Monday morning comes around and we totally mess it up. 
absolute truth is that God will still love you. I'm not giving you a license to go out and do it wrong. I'm reminding you that when we fall down, he is still there with us. And he's willing to help. But we have to be willing to accept that help. We have to be willing to do whatever it is he's asked us to do. He's not promised it's easy. He's not promised it's smooth. But he has promised there's a blessing on the other side of it. And that blessing, it doesn't matter what it is. Because if it's from God, I promise you it's, it's worth it. Some people think if you put $20 in the offering plate, you're going to get it back on Monday morning. That's not how that works. Some people think if they, if they provide food to somebody in need, that God's going to just turn around and provide food right back to you. That's not how that works. Our willingness to serve and be in service and to do for others and to do what God has called us to do in those moments only gives us the promise that he will bless us. But that blessing is all up to him. And he will bless us in all different ways. Some amazing ways. Maybe you need a boat full of fish. I don't know what you need, but God does. Would you stand with me as we close? Father, all over this room, as we stand in your presence, you know the heart of everyone here today. Father, we're here about your good news. The good news that you not only love us, but you want what's best for us. You want us to learn it, be willing to do it, and to be used, God, by you to do some amazing things. This isn't about miracles that I can do or some sort of identity trip. This is, this is you in us calling us to just be willing to serve, to be used of you, God, to do your work, to lead others to Christ. So, Lord, as we stand here this morning, we ask that you would move amongst your people. Begin to stir that flame. Get those coals moving around. Fan them a little bit. Some of us might need reignited. But Lord, help us to be willing that we might honor you, that we, we might bless you. God, help us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.